We're glad to know you're still there and uh, watching the run-up today. Um, we did promise you that we're going to be talking with, uh, or we are going to talk about how much preparation INEC has done to include the people living with disabilities. And in case you're wondering, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and its optional protocol uh, 2006 defines persons with disabilities to include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Uh, so even building on that, I would say that the people living with disabilities are those uh, that cannot perform optimally because of what is available to them in the society, which they cannot use to their advantage. So we see that in situations of forced displacements, persons with disabilities uh, have the same rights and basic needs as others and face the same challenges. However, they face numerous additional barriers they face particular protection risks, including a heightened risk of violence, exploitation, and abuse, and a high level of stigma. They have difficulties assessing humanitarian assistance, education, livelihoods, health care, and other services. They may be denied certain legal rights and are often excluded from decision-making processes and leadership. With the 2023 elections in view, we will be looking at the concerns of these PWDs, that is people with disabilities. How much are they included in the electoral process and many more, and what are their concerns? So joining us to discuss this is Dr. Adebukola Adebayo, a specialist in disability rights, inclusive development, governance, and public policy farmer, England, United Kingdom. Well, we're glad to welcome you to the program today, uh, Mr. Adebayo. Welcome to the run-up. Thank you. Good morning, viewers. Okay, let's let's just um, uh, because every year or or from time to time, definitions about what um, a person with disabilities uh, is changes. You know, so let's let's just start with what in the Nigerian context and uh, recognize the world over is a person with disability, regardless of what we have just uh, told the people in our introduction. Well, what you have told the people is actually the, the, the right thing, and uh, Nigeria being the signatory to that uh, convention has adopted that definition in the uh, Disability Act, that Discrimination Against Persons with Disabilities Prohibition Act of 2018, that was signed into law in 2019, January by the President. And uh, if you'd like to know, there is a National Commission for Persons with Disabilities that was established in, in August of 2020. <coughs> so Nigeria has adopted that uh, CRPD definition, and that's what is operational uh, all over the country uh, as we speak. Okay, so uh, they, this um, commission has just been established. 2020 is just two years uh, ago. Uh, so far, what is the current situation of persons living with disabilities in Nigeria because of this uh, new uh, innovation, let me call it, uh, of Nigeria, establishing this commission and to take care of the people with disabilities. How has the situation changed for the better or for the worse? Uh, of course, uh, we will see that the signing of the Act itself was uh, a major achievement. Uh, uh, if you look at other countries like Kenya, like Uganda, South Africa, and so on, many of them had signed Act had the disability, National Disability Act for many years before Nigeria, you know, and um, for, for Nigerians to now have this Disability Act after many years of struggles, I think is, is a major achievement. At least we have something, a framework to guide policymakers on how to, you know, uh, uh, support persons with disabilities, how to ensure their total inclusion in all uh, sectors you know, or spheres of life. Um, it, it's been a gradual process, but let me also add that before 2019, at state levels, many states like Lagos, like Batu states, you know, uh, had the like Bauchi state assigned, you know, their disability laws. So we've had state level disability laws even before the National Disability Act. And uh, so many of these states had even set up their uh, agencies to implement these laws 
before the National Disability Commission came on board in 2020. So we, we, we are not actually on ground zero, but of course I must, you must agree with me that there is a lot of grounds to cover. You know, because of the way we, 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 we um, conduct governance in this part of the world, you know, uh, there is a lot of a lot of road to cover in various sectors like education, like health, like public infrastructure, transportation, you know, and so on. And even in terms of uh, uh, general public attitude, you know, the behavior of the public towards persons with disabilities, the general lack of awareness. So we, we are still not where we want to be, but we have actually taken off, you know, and of course, albeit very slowly, but I, I, at least you agree with me that uh, something is being done. It's the quality of what is being done now that is the debate for us uh, as a disability you know, community, and especially as the elections draw near. All right. Uh, taking it up from where you just stopped, you know, mentioning how that the elections are drawing near, uh, how has the inclusion of PWBs, uh, PWDs, forgive me, been uh, in the whole electoral process, you know, from both the registration of voters and even at the point of collection now, how has it been for PWDs? Yeah, the, the, the journey of um, inclusive electoral process, especially for people with disabilities, started in, in 2013, 2014, preparatory to the 2015 general election. At that point, what we were even asking for was like, okay, can we even be prioritized? Can we be allowed to vote first? We called it priority voting then. And that was what really happened in 2015. But going forward from 2015, the advocacy stepped up. And we are talking about more accessible election beyond priority voting, being able to vote independently and in secrecy. And I think that uh, based on this series of advocacy, uh, which I, uh, uh, I happen to be privileged to, you know, to, to be involved, INEC developed what they call the disability framework for uh, the inclusion and participation of persons with disability in the electoral process. That framework was developed in 2018, and it really had a landmark impact on the 2019 election because we then began to see um, uh, tools and technologies that allowed PWDs to vote, not just in terms of priority voting, but of course use of gadgets like what we call the Braille uh, ballot guide for the blind, the uh, magnifiers for persons with albinism, um, the, 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 the positioning of polling centers or polling units in places that are physically accessible for wheelchair users, and the deployment of sign language interpreters uh, as much as possible. So all of this started in, in 2019. But of course, we weren't satisfied with some of the results because we saw that INEC didn't have the, the needed database of voters with disabilities. And the advocacy stepped up, and as we speak, uh, in the last uh, continuous voter registration that took place, INEC has not been able to disaggregate its, its, its data by, you know, by disabilities, such that INEC now knows in any polling booth how many persons with disabilities are registered in that polling booth, and what type of disabilities they have, and what you know, the needs they will, they will, they will, they will, that, 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 that should be provided for them to vote, you know, just like every other person. And we saw this demonstrated in uh, off-season elections in uh, Oshun and in the Kiti and other places before uh, the, the, these uh, 2023 elections that we are all now planning for. So there has been a, uh, because of my direct involvement, I can, I can see a land, you know, very, very significant improvement in that journey towards having a more disability inclusive uh, electoral uh, process. So we, we hope that in 2023, we will be able to vote, you know, we will have more persons with disabilities coming out to vote. Of course, we are registered, uh, we, we campaigned, we, we worked with INEC to ensure that uh, uh, persons with disabilities came out to register, you know, and uh, we, we hope that we will have more voters with disabilities participating in the electoral, in, in, in 2023 elections. Okay. Uh, 
just I, I don't know if I wanted to ask yeah. you, you know, a, still talking about inclusiveness, do you think political parties have, you know, done enough to make the ground bearable or level enough for persons with disabilities to also come out and vie for political offices? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, with these uh, elections that we are preparing for, we've left that stage now. But I will tell you that uh, this the political parties that we, we still have issues with at the moment. Although a couple of the political parties, or some of them, have tried to uh, you know uh, bring in persons with disabilities into their leadership, into the, the leadership of the parties. For example, in some parties, uh, like let's say the APC now, uh, I think even the PDP, uh, I don't know much of other parties, but I know those two or two, those two parties uh, I, 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 at national and state levels, and even at local government levels, have uh, elected uh, persons with disabilities to represent PWDs, you know, in the leadership of those parties at those levels. You know, but in terms of vying for, for, for uh, uh, elective positions uh, outside of the political parties, that is, maybe as uh, uh, councillors or ch council chairmen or as uh, state assembly candidates or governorship or national assembly, we have not seen, you know, that in, in at all. That is still very, very far-fetched, um, largely because of the costs associated with uh, electioneering in Nigeria, the very high cost. And the fact that government, unlike in some other countries like the U.S., does not support, you know, political campaign funding and things like that. So uh, uh, the, the, one of the things that have kept persons with disabilities out of, you know, vying for elective positions, apart from party leadership, is the cost of elections, you know, in, in Nigeria. And I think that one of the solutions to that is, is to adopt the affirmative action that like we see in Burundi, in Uganda, you know, some other countries where persons with disabilities are given quotas, you know, especially in parliament, you know, to, to, to hold certain positions. They're, 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 those positions are left for PWDs alone to contest for among themselves, you know, so that they can have a voice, especially in parliament. So we, we have not seen that in Nigeria. And of course, when it comes to appointment, you know, into political offices, the appointing positions. We are also still very far-fetched because um, the only trend that is going on now is that of, in states where you have agencies for man, to, to manage disability affairs, you see, um, you know, people with disabilities being appointed into those positions. But we are saying that just as you have positions for women, positions for youths, we have ministries of women and affairs. We have ministries for youth development, you know, and you still have women and youth being appointed into other positions apart from those uh, specific agencies established for them. So we are saying that you shouldn't limit people with disabilities just to uh, disability agencies that are set up for them. Uh, I, I'm a development consultant, for example, and I, I'm a public policy expert. So I'm not just talking about disability. I deal with public policy generally. So you can't just limit me to just uh, be appointed as a manager or as a, as a uh, member of uh, an agency for, for disability affairs. So that's what we are pushing. We are pushing for more and more inclusion. That, that's, that's where we are now. Now, uh, before the 2023, are there other concerns that... Uh, the people living with disabilities have because recently we still saw the PWDs on the street still talking about 2023 how they need to be included and they even still mentioned Braille and interpreters at the polling units and all the things that you have mentioned that INEC and the federal government have done graciously to make sure that you are included. Are there any other concerns that you would like to be addressed and that you know can be addressed before 2023? Okay, I, I want you to take out that word graciously. It's a right. It's not. Uh, it's not a favor. It's a right. I take you know, it back. Uh, then. We, want, we want inclusion of persons with disabilities to be rights based. It's not to be based on whims and caprice or the favor of anybody in, in government. That's first. But secondly, in terms of our asks, you know, uh, for in, for more inclusion, I've just told you the the the, the, the fact that we've been left out 
of you know uh, 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 ability to contest for position. But when it comes to appointing positions, I, I think it is where the government or political actors have the opportunity to really engage more persons with disabilities, you know, to bring them on board. But in terms of, uh, apart from that, you also need to look at, like I said earlier, the quality of inclusion across sectors. Okay, uh, for example, here in Lagos, we we we, we developed and um, and launched a charter of demand uh, about two three weeks ago. You know, to, to push the Lagos state government to really improve on the quality of inclusion. We don't want tokenism, okay? We want a more systemic and sustainable approach to disability inclusion in, in Lagos state, for example, and around and all over the country. Because when you look at education, for example, uh, many states will tell you they are implementing inclusive education. But when you go around, the quality of this inclusion is very low. At best, all you see is mainstreaming or integration, not real inclusion. There are no teachers, there are no enough teachers, there are not enough uh, uh, teaching aids, assistive teaching aids. Many of the schools do not have safe and accessible uh, uh, physical environments, okay? And so on and so forth. We've done a lot of research around all of this, and we put a lot of information out there for government to use to develop, you know, to improve on the quality of inclusive education. The same thing with health. In Lagos State, I keep using Lagos State because that's my base. Uh, for instance, in Lagos, you have this health insurance program, and you also have it at national level. But you will see that the, the, the components, what make up the, the, the focus of this health insurance, does not take cognizance of the health needs of persons with disabilities. For example, people with intellectual developmental disabilities, they often need a lot of health support, you know, therapies, all manner of therapies, or you know, physical, occupational therapy, and so on. But all of these are not covered in the health insurance program. The same thing with persons with albinism, persons with spinal cord injuries, and so on, or persons with spinal bifida and hydrocephalus. Many of these disabilities are very complex, and they need they are really, really dependent on consistent medical support. So when you have an health insurance program that does not cover their needs, health needs, or you do not even have special intervention programs, to take care of their of their needs, then there, there is no way we will say that health insurance is inclusive. Okay? The same thing with even the way the governance of disability affairs generally. Most of the time, the process of governing disability affairs is limited to state capitals. If you go around Lagos State, for example, go to the internal, the, the, the distant local governments, you will not feel the presence of the disability agency across the states okay you uh, see? people still have to come to the state's capital to register to pick forms to so that they can be documented well dr bio dr bio um i think there is more to be said but once again i take back the wrong terminology that i used uh, about graciously uh, it wasn't intended in any other way than to say they have uh, done the needful but it's a right, like you said, and the advocacy will not only remain with the people living with disabilities. I think we, even in the media, need to step up as well. But we also need to have the correct data from both sides, whether the government or the PWDs themselves, so that the advocacy can be uh, stepped up a notch higher. But it's always a pleasure talking with you. And before we get into 2023, I'm sure we'll still need to engage you a few more times. And we're hoping that you will still oblige us when that time comes. Thank you so much for being a part of our show today. Thanks so much. We've been talking with Dr. Adebukola Adebayo, specialist in disability rights, inclusive development, governance, and public policy. And uh, he has been telling us what the challenges are and how far the government has mm -hmm. gone. And I do hope that all their, all their needs will be met. Like I said yeah. in the beginning, disability is not just someone who has missed a limb or something. If, for instance, all literature were in Braille, I will be so disabled. <laughs> <laughs> Because I can't read a thing. Oh, yeah, that's a see. good one. So, <laughs> so everybody is disabled in some way if the society has not put in place the right things that you can use to your advantage. And this is it on this uh, segment of the program. We will be going on a quick break, and the news will come up at noon. After the news, we will return. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us.